Okay, there is some scripture in Matthew 20, 20 through 28, and you don't have to go there. I'm just going to kind of skim over these. They aren't the point, but it's, um, it shows how much we long to be great. And everybody in here wants to be like, oh, I don't long to be great. Yeah, you do. Just, just hush. You do. Everybody wants to be great. And, um, and God's going to tell us how to become great because that desire is deep down in us. It just is. We're made in the image of the great one, and we have a desire for that. So James and John, their mother, I love this. She reminds me of me going up, can you make Andrew and Scott you two top people? That would be me probably. But they're the sons of thunder, but they still got a mama <laughs> that's going up going, Jesus, can I talk to you for a second? Um, it says... The mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What do you want, he asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit on your right and the left. She didn't got room for nobody else to sit down. One on each side. Uh, he says, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? And the boys are standing there, obviously, because they're like, yeah, we can. We can't wait to drink out of that goblet with the king. They don't even know what they're asking because they think this is the kingdom and Jesus is going to set it up and they're going to be the big dogs at the front. So Jesus said, you will indeed drink from my cup because one of them was the first martyr. James was killed for his faith. John didn't, he lived to be old, but it was a, it was a great life and a hard life. He said, you will drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared by my father. And listen to this. The other 10 heard it and they were furious because they probably want to be on the right and the left, right? (laughs) They were all mad. I said, sometimes we get the maddest at people when they have the same junk we have in them. They're trying to be the big noise at the party when we want to be the big noise at the party. So we're like, can you believe them over there? And we're thinking, they're getting all the attention and I'm not. But the 10 heard about this and they were mad with the two brothers. Jesus had to call them all together. Doesn't this sound like a mother? He said, you know the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. He said, it's not going to be this way with you. And then he tells us how to be great. He said, instead... Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave, your doulos. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And Jesus didn't tell them anything that he wasn't willing to do. Jesus did the lowest of the low. He washed feet when nobody else would wash feet. Nobody would have done that. None of the disciples. That is God in the flesh. He said, if you want to be great, become a servant and a slave. How many people think, you signed me up. Yes. Judas was sitting there. He was a betrayer. Peter told Jesus, and I love good old Peter. You know, when Peter said, everybody's going to leave me, strike the shepherd, you're going to be scattered. And Peter goes over and goes, everybody else might. Never. I will die with you. And then Peter not only leaves, but he denies that he even knows Jesus three times. So um, all of them wanted to be at the top. They wanted to be with the popular crowd. How many in us, of us in here lose sleep over not being with the popular crowd? I have, I'm, it amazes me. It's that way with the teenagers. It's that way with 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds. When I worked in the senior living, they were mad about the little groups over there. Be like, I hate them. They're just so this and that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not kidding. It nothing ever changes. I said, people got the FOMO, I got the phobia, fear of being invited. (laughs) But all of them had great hopes that Jesus would be a conqueror, and they thought he was going to be. He told them, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to die. Somehow, none of them heard it. He told them over and over again. Nobody believed him. 
And they thought he would conquer Rome and they would be his homies. <laughs> so the day Jesus, of course, gets crucified. And then on the third day, he rises again and the ladies go and they find that his body's gone. They talk to Jesus. And then they go back and tell the disciples. And um, a couple of them come, Peter and John, I think it is. They see that he's not in there. They go home. And then Mary gets to see Jesus, all the things. So that same day, you have two of his disciples. They're not one of the 12 apostles, but two of his disciples, because there were more than 12. There were 120 in the upper room. But he had he'd send out 72. So he had other disciples. So two of them... On the same day that Jesus was resurrected, we're on the road to Emmaus. And they were about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that happened. And as they were talking, Jesus himself came up and talked to them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? And they stood still with sadness on their faces. And one of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened here in recent days? What things? Can y'all just imagine Jesus? Um, the events involving Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. The man was a prophet, powerful in speech and action before God and all the people. Our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to sentence of death and they crucified him. And listen to what they said. But we were hoping he was the one who would redeem Israel. What does that tell you about his disciples? They thought they were going to get an earthly kingdom they were following the king. They were going to be the men. Rome was going down. Jesus was going to, you know, call fire down from heaven, whatever. But they were like, let us be with you. Let's do this thing. And then he's dead. And they're like, oh my goodness. So we see from this that they had no idea what the kingdom Jesus was talking about actually looked like and how it operated. They only saw value in this kingdom. How many of us have a really hard time not sowing everything into this kingdom and thinking this kingdom is where it all is? I think everybody does. They operated like everyone else until the Holy Spirit came. The kingdom we are a part of is not seen. It's real, but it's invisible to us. But more real than what we can see. That kingdom, this whole thing down here is really just a shadow of reality. God's kingdom is more real than this kingdom. We just don't have eyes to see it. And I'm going to tell you the way we start to see it is looking at God's word, doing what it says, and then we get to watch God move in and do big things in our lives. The way that that kingdom operates is opposite of basically everything in this kingdom. The way God is and the way we are are worlds apart. Remember, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. It doesn't mean they're different. They're totally like they're in different universes, God's way and our way. Thank goodness we have his words written down so we can start to understand what his kingdom is like, what's important, how to live. Since we have God's spirit inside of us, those two kingdoms have collided. And with our cooperation and deliberate choices, we can choose to focus on God's kingdom. We have the Holy Spirit in us that longs for God's kingdom, God's truth, and God's freedom. We long for it. Like, if you're just lost and you don't have the Holy Spirit, you can go enjoy sin all you want to. But once the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, you can go sin, but the fun's just not there anymore. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I remember I did go to the club, I think, one time after I got saved. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, this is just not the same anymore. I just did not even feel good. But it, that, we change inside and you can't enjoy the sin kingdom anymore. You almost can't enjoy God's kingdom. You're at this place where there's a, just a war going on. And as we get in God's word and we start to believe him and do what he says, this kingdom starts to become less and less and his kingdom starts to become precious to us. And now with his Holy Spirit in us, it means his kingdom has come to earth and that kingdom is internal we can now shine with the light of Christ in this world every single day. How? I'm glad you asked. Jesus shows us exactly how to live a life of shining for him and greatness. 
He shows us how to be a miracle. Those of you that have children in your home, let your life be a miracle. Let them see people come against you and let them see Christ in you. You are not going to make it through this world unscathed. You're going to have neighbors you want to cuss at. You're going to have people you want to be mean to. You're going to want to talk about people behind their backs. That will make a huge impression on your child. Or you can say to your children, that is a soul that God made. I will dare not speak a word against them. They are precious to God. That will make an impression on your children too. Be a miracle. Don't be like everybody else. Anybody can hate people that hate them. And anybody can love people that love them. Be a miracle. God wants to do that in us. Okay, this is the mindset of Christ. This is Philippians 2, 5 through 11. And I probably could have just taught two verses and had plenty to teach, but I want to get through a little bit of this. But this is Jesus, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Can you imagine that kind of equality with God? Somebody looks at you with a smirk or calls you demon-possessed. Can you imagine being able to go, you're gone. (laughs) I mean, can you imagine having that kind of power just available? Or you could just turn on that transfiguration and be like, and be just shining like a light and they fall to the ground. I mean, I can't imagine having that kind of power at my disposal and just taking it. But he did. He did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. Oh, how opposite this is of the world. Go to any counselor and they'll tell you all the things you need to do. Come to me and I will tell you the opposite probably. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. And, you know, it says in there that we're to have the the same mindset as Christ. A mindset is a fixed state of mind. You will not be moved because your mind is set on something. In Greek, it means an inner perspective that shows itself in corresponding outward behavior. So what you think about yourself inside will show itself in the way you behave. Does that make sense? All right. And it talks about having that mindset. And in 1 Corinthians 2.16, it says, Who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. So don't tell me you can't have a mindset like Christ, or you can't understand the way Christ operates, or you can't understand the way God is, because God, through salvation, has put the very mind of Christ inside of each one of us. Think about that. It's unbelievable that he did that. So whatever our perspective of of ourselves, that's the way we'll expect to be treated. I will behave a certain way when my perspective of me is not respected. This, your perspective of yourself can be way too high or it can be way too low. Both of these will make us miserable. Low self-esteem and high self-esteem are both wrong. We should have no self-esteem or no esteem of ourselves at all. All this self-esteem, we should have God esteem. There's nothing to esteem in myself, but there is a holy God that lives in me that can do whatever he wants. Does that make sense? Because high self-esteem makes us miserable because we're always offended by somebody. Low self-esteem makes us miserable because we feel inferior to everyone. God doesn't want us to have either one. We should have the same mindset as Jesus And thankfully, we're told what that is. And I'm going to read through parts of this. And his mindset was this. He didn't consider the equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but he made himself nothing. We have to get a right perspective and mind about ourselves. When we have expectations of what following Christ is, and then it proves to be the opposite, How can we follow him? I think people sometimes think, I'm going to follow Christ so my life will improve. 
How many of you found that's not true if you're really going to follow Christ? Christ is trying to not let you die, not improve your life. And I, I have people come to me and they'll be like, I got saved and I felt so good and I'm struggling now. And I'm like, because you're trying to die to yourself and live to the life of Christ in you. Dying is not fun. Would y'all agree? It's not. So when he lets things come against us, we want to panic and we want it out of our lives when he's saying, I'm bringing this so that you can understand who I am and so you can take a back seat and you can watch me do my thing as you walk through this hard circumstance. Always. He is never just leaving you, but he wants you to walk through circumstances his way. And I'm going to tell you something, not that we never fight for ourselves, I'm not saying that, but when you fight for yourself, usually that's all you're going to get. You did it. You got what you wanted. You blessed somebody out. You did whatever it was you were going to do. Instead of coming back and say, Jesus, what would you have me do? Go to scripture and let God walk you through it. And when you do that, you get to watch God get his big self up and fight for you in ways that you never dreamed, while also humbling you and making you feel wonderful. When you see God is deeply involved in your life, that's the greatest confidence builder in the world. What's better than having the king of glory micromanaging your life? Nothing. So we have to get that about ourselves, our perspective right. He's our leader, and we're to keep our eyes fixed on him and he's going to lead us down the same path he went. But we now have the Spirit of God, the same Spirit in us that is God. We have God in us. We are one with God. How do we look at that truth? That we are one with God. We don't have to use it to our own advantage. We shouldn't use it to our own advantage. Has anybody ever been like, I'm God's child. He's going to get you. I mean, how many of you have wanted to do that? You go ahead and do what you want. God's going to come after you. Um, anybody else ever felt like doing that before? And then he doesn't do anything and you feel like a big dummy? Because <laughs> you done made a fool out of yourself. <laughs> so we don't use the fact that God's in us to our own advantage. We're to become nothing. Why? Because in becoming nothing, God can manifest himself in us in a way that brings us fulfillment. Makes us completely humble and we can quit worrying about ourselves. I promise you, our preoccupation with us is the root of most of our misery. I'm going to say it one more time. <laughs> our preoccupation with us is one of the main roots of all of our misery because we're worried about us. Our scheming to get what we want makes us hateful. It makes us want to fight. James 4, 1 says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? And he will tell us, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? What causes fights and quarrels? Our desires do. If we could only become nothing, his light would manifest in us and fill us to the brim and shine for the world to see. My agenda and your agenda stops God from being his big, beautiful, loving, unbelievable self inside of us. Emptied. When it said he emptied himself, what does that word mean in Greek? It means to empty out, to render void, passive, to be emptied. Hence, without recognition and perceived as valueless. The most valuable being in the universe came to the earth and emptied himself so that he was perceived as valueless. How else would soldiers have slapped him, mocked him, ripped out his beard and beat him black and blue if they did not believe that he had zero value? And how did they continue to do that? Because he's God. He could have called down 10,000 angels, but he was passive and he did nothing about it whatsoever. His nature, he took upon himself um, by taking the nature of a servant. A nature is an outward expression that embodies an essential inner substance. So the form is in complete harmony with the inner essence. That means he was so, the nature of a servant was so much what he took upon himself inside that it manifested 
manifested itself in the way he lived. And a servant. He took upon the nature of a servant. And I'm looking up these words because they're just, it's unbelievable. Who would have ever written down that the God of the universe did this? Who would have made that up? Nobody. Superheroes on TV, what do they do? They're Hulk. They're people that do this and you stop in your tracks. They can pulverize you. No superhero ever did this except the real one. A servant, someone who belongs to another. If you belong to Jesus Christ, are you your own or do you belong to someone else? We're so dang independent. Someone who belongs to another, a bond slave, listen to this, without any ownership rights of their own. Ironically, doulos, which means bond slave, is used with the highest dignity in the New Testament, namely of believers who willingly live under Christ's authority as his devoted followers. So that word doulos is a beautiful word in the New Testament because it means you're somebody that has given up your life for Jesus Christ. My Becca had me write the word doulos and she had it tattooed across her little waist right here because I told her from the time she was little, she was a servant. I wrote a scripture for her and I framed it because that's what I saw in her heart and that's what I wanted her to be. I never was like, you are a woman, hear me roar. I was like, you be a servant, baby. You serve because you've got a mighty God in heaven. Don't worry about asserting your rights. I have never done that kind of junk with my kids at all. So a servant belongs to another and it is without any ownership rights of their own. This is God in the form of flesh. And he couldn't become something he wasn't. When he became a servant, that had to be in him or he couldn't become that because God is immutable. He can't change. So that servant heart is our God. And for Jesus to come, that's who he is. He is a servant but he's going to come again as a conquering king and he will be full of glory the next time. He will not be empty the next time. He will be shining. He will have a sword coming out of his mouth and he is going to strike down his enemies. So don't mistake this for weakness. He emptied himself and he is showing us how to live on this planet because it's hard to live down here. I talk to people all the time in my own life. It's hard to live down here. Is it not hard? So he's telling us, you live in a kingdom that's telling you all this stuff about how to be happy and how to be, have an abundant life. And I'm telling you how to actually have an abundant life. And it sounds crazy, but it is absolutely the best way to live. The moment we care about our own name and our reputation, we're going the opposite way of Jesus Christ. Who cares about our reputation? Can I tell you something? Jesus didn't have a good reputation. He didn't. He was called a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of sinners. He wasn't a glutton and a drunkard, but he was called that because of who he hung out with. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone could come, would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And anybody that saw somebody walking through town with a cross, do you think they thought they were coming home for dinner that night? No. Taking up a cross. These are the things Jesus said to people. He did not bait and switch and say, I'm promising you this, but it's actually going to be this. This is what he told us. It's what he told us about life. He said, if you would come, if you're going to be my disciple, my follower, come after me, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And we're actually following a conquering king. And he has never been defeated. And he always has a plan. And as long as we deny ourselves, take up our cross, whatever that means to us personally, whatever pain it brings to us personally, he says, if you follow me, you will always be conquering whatever I want to be conquered. It may be you he's trying to conquer so that you can actually live. It is not always going to feel good and you're not going to be high-fiving everybody down the street. Sometimes you're going to be like, Lord, this is killing me. And he's like, good, that's what I'm trying to do is kill you so you can actually live. Jesus obeyed all the way to his dying breath all the way to the cross. He denied himself and his will for his entire life and he lived in perfect love and fullness. Did Jesus seem unhappy while he was down here? No, he wasn't. He was very happy. He let his father decide everything for him with no complaints ever. Another thing I taught my kids, I said every complaint is a complaint against God. 
don't do it. Every complaint, because God is God, he has given us our circumstances, so don't complain, because it's a complaint against God. Has anybody ever just enjoyed being around somebody that complains all the time? Is it just, do you love it? Do you say, like, I hope I call so-and-so and they complain a little bit more? <laughs> just lifts me up. No, I mean, people don't like complaining, so if you're a complainer, stop. People will like you better. He, um, he let his father decide everything for him, whether he was exalted or whether he was told he was demon-possessed. He didn't get the big head and he didn't get offended. What do we really have to be defensive about when it comes right down to it? He lacked, Jesus lacked nothing of value down here and he had no home and almost no possessions. He couldn't be humiliated because he had no ego. Guess why I get humiliated? Because I've got an ego. Guess why I get embarrassed? Because I've got an ego. He chose to become nothing. Scripture says that we're to think this way. Not because we're nothing, but we have God in us to be all that we are not. We don't use God for our own advantage. We simply live and let him fight our battles and decides what's best for his great name. In other words, he wants us to live in freedom. In the process, we will have contentment, joy, and love. The last part of those scriptures, because Jesus humbled himself and became nothing. Because of that, it says, therefore, and when therefore is there, it's therefore, whatever came before it. Because Jesus did all those things. It said, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, under earth. Every tongue acknowledge that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. We will not be exalted to the place of Jesus, of course, because he's at the very top. But scripture makes it plain that God will exalt a person who willingly humbles himself. God can humble anybody anytime he wants. It says so in the book of Daniel. Those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. But if we humble ourselves, listen to this. Humble yourselves. God tells us these things because he loves us so greatly. How many of us love to lift our children up? We love it, and I know God loves to do that with us, but he said, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Why? So that at the proper time he may exalt you. What? God wants to exalt us, and he can't if we exalt ourselves. He said, if you'll humble yourself, become a servant, take the last place, become nothing. Don't fight for yourself. Watch what I'll do for you. I will exalt you. And then it says, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. A person who humbles themselves will not expect great things from themselves. They will cast their anxiety on their father because a humble person will live in the presence of God. And you will trust him because you're in his presence. And when you're anxious, which we all will be, he says, humble yourselves, give me all your troubles. And he says, I care for you. I will take care of this. Proud Christian is an oxymoron, and it makes us into a moron. <laughs> we all want to be great, and it's not a bad desire. Jesus wouldn't have addressed us and told us how to be great if he didn't want us to be great his way. He wants us to. This desire is in us, but how we, fu how we fulfill it will completely shape our lives. We will either seek it God's way and live a life that's a miracle that cannot be explained, or we will seek it the world's way and we will be an irritating soul sucker. Someone who gives up their lives because they feel horrible about, them, horrible about themselves will give, 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 and still be empty. We've been all been around these people who are always concerned for others, but no one cares for me. <laughs> Has anybody ever been around those people? I just give, give, give. Nobody comes to see me. No. I mean, it's, those are hard people to be around. Am I right? They're trying so hard to have their cup filled, and it makes us a soul sucker. We have to give up our lives for the sake of Jesus, not for the sake of a human being or human praise. The other kingdom has to become real or we'll live for this kingdom. 
Listen to this about Paul, 2 Corinthians 12, 11. Paul said this about himself. He said, I have made a fool of myself, but you drove me to it. I ought to have been commended by you, for I'm not the least inferior to the super apostles, even though I am nothing. I want you to hear what Paul's saying there. They were being mean to Paul, and he said, I should have been commended by, by you, because I'm not inferior to these super apostles that you're following. When you really have the esteem that God wants us to have, knowing we're nothing but he's everything that we're deeply cared for, you don't feel inferior to anybody else. And Paul said, even though I'm nothing, that's the key to why Paul became great because Paul knew who he was, nothing. And I don't know of a single person ever, and I've said this before, that came closer to being like Jesus Christ than Paul who said, I would be... I would be cut off from Christ and go to hell if my brothers could be saved. Who talks like that? Jesus. And he became so much like Jesus because he became nothing. And because he became nothing, he got Christ's mind in him. He got Christ's heart in him. He felt about himself the way Christ felt about himself to a large degree. I don't know that anybody actually gets there, but nothing, it didn't bother him if he was looked over. It didn't make him feel great if he was exalted. He would tell people, don't exalt me, actually. People tried to worship him. He's like, don't do that. So he didn't feel inferior, even though he knew he was nothing. Richard Warmbron, and I only have a few people I can talk about because there aren't many of these people in the world. Richard Warmbron became nothing. I listened to a sermon of his today called The Beauty of Nothing. Corey Tim Boom became nothing. I remember uh, somebody asked her, how does she handle all the praise she gets? And she said, well, I kind of feel like that donkey Jesus rode into Jerusalem on. Do you think that donkey thought everybody was clapping for him? <laughs> she said, I basically just carried Jesus. But you know, she, was, she became nothing and she was so full, so fallible, so human, but so full. Madame Guion became nothing. And she said, a person truly humbled permits not anything to put him in a rage as it is pride which dies last in the soul. So it is passion which is last destroyed in the outward conduct. A soul thoroughly dead to itself find nothing, finds nothing of rage left. And she said, while I was a prisoner in, at Vincenze, I passed my time in great peace, content to pass the rest of my life there, if that was the will of God. I sang songs of joy, which the maid who served me learned by heart as fast as I made them, and we together sang thy praises, O my God. The stones of my prison looked in my eyes like rubies. I esteemed them more than all the gaudy brilliances of a vain world. My heart was full of that joy which you give to those who love you in the midst of their great crosses." Something you can't buy, it's something you can't fake, and you can't duplicate. That is something that God Almighty will put in us. And I'm going to just tell you something. We don't have forever to do this. If y'all listened to the last series, Endgame, I'm expecting Jesus to come back maybe before I get home tonight. <laughs> I mean, it, we're at a time. we got to wake up. We don't have to forever to get this and just limp along in life. God wants us to understand, I love you, whoever you are. Your past doesn't define you. Nothing to find you. Let me have you empty yourself and I will so run your life and so give you the joy that you can't imagine. The more nothing we become, the more God Almighty will pour into us. He promises, it says that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him and God gives God-sized rewards. How do we ever come to this place of nothing as Jesus did? We have to get the mind of Christ. We have need of so much in this world to feel safe. It's scary down here. Our flesh desires so much. We feel inferior. We feel broken. We feel superior. We feel like our past will forever define us. Life may be great, and our desire to keep the hammer from dropping may torment us. Because even when things are going great, you're worried about what's coming, right? Someone said to me, I'm always waiting for the other shoe to drop. And I told them plainly, it will. So how do we live? We have to decide to die so Christ can live in both big things and little things. He'll give us ample opportunities daily if we ask him for eyes to see him working. 
Jesus lived in a broken and hostile world in complete victory every single moment. Even being murdered was complete victory because that was God's plan. Nothing happened to him outside God's will. Even if you get outside God's will, God's outside of that will to get your butt back in his will. So we, we can't not do this. God is working all the time in our lives. Jesus was never a victim of anyone and neither are we. I need to feel completely safe and important and so do you. The only place we'll ever know this reality is when we become nothing. When we have no agenda, God can work through us unimpeded. We will seek him every day. When We will seek him, see him work every day, I'm sorry. We'll see him open doors, we'll see him shut doors, and we will live in the freedom of a child who never really has a boring day. As Gaines always says to me, Mimi, this was the best day ever. How can he do that? How, and I'm not trying to be unrealistic. We have sadness, we have death, we have destruction, we have a lot of, we have bad diagnoses. But if we have him, we can run to him at every moment and we can receive his comfort, we can receive his help in our time of need. Jesus sweated blood because something was so bad, getting ready to go to the cross. I'm not trying to give us a, a weird idea of what living the Christian life is, but we have the creator of the universe at our, within reach 24-7 all the time that we can learn to run to him at all times. And this takes time because we're used to operate in a certain way. How can we live this way and how can we have days like that? Because when the hammer drops, we understand it can't drop outside the will of our Father. Bad things and good things can become somewhat the same. Not, like I said, death, all that. That's horrible, horrific, and God will have to walk us through those things. But everything we walk through can bring glory to the name of Jesus and help us see God's invisible kingdom in the middle of this kingdom. We don't have to fight for our reputation. As I said, Jesus didn't have a good reputation, but Jesus lost no sleep over what people said about him. He became nothing, no ego, only the will of God. Study his life. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the story of Jesus from birth to death. That's what we signed up for. And he told us to take up our cross and follow him. And ours is only figurative. His was real. And he was obedient to death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him. True humility will bring exaltation into our lives because God can't lie. He told us these things because they are the secrets to his kingdom. He longs for his children to be great. He wants us to be fulfilled. He wants us to be happy. And he knows the way. He wants us to believe him and humble ourselves. So in return, he can do great things through us and make us great. Let's pray. Father, I just... Um, I know this life just a little bit and it has made me hungry to know it more and it has made me so eager to tell others how to go. God, it's so, so opposite of what our brains tell us. But if we will just take you at your word and take small steps toward forgetting ourselves, you will give us opportunities throughout each day to take a second place to give somebody a bigger piece of pie, whatever it is, you will give us little ways to take the back seat, to become a servant, to say, let me help pick that up, whatever it is. And in doing that, God, you start to manifest yourself in us and you help us to become like you. Because in becoming like you, we will truly, truly learn to forget ourselves and live a full life that is full of light and love. God, I pray that you would do that in us. Let this world see who you are and let them see it through us. In Jesus' name, amen.